for me along with Nick. Far dearer the grave or the prison, the hound from patriot name, than all of the trophies risen on liberty's moons to fame. The Independent National Commemoration Committee has honored me by inviting me to speak at the oration here, at the commemoration here for Commandant General Tom Barry. And I stand here this evening with the greatest admiration for the man at this place, a holy place, a sacred place made sacred because it holds the remains of a joint of Irish freedom, a colossus in the fight against oppression that had plagued our country for centuries. Tom was from a Christiana, selfless, with an, indis an indisputable integrity. I first learned about Tom when I was a child from my late dad. Ireland was truly blessed when Tom came to the world on the 1st of July, 1897. I think it was the 2nd, actually. He was one of 14 children born to Margaret and Thomas Barry. She was a, a Donovan. His father was in the RIC. He became completely disillusioned with them and left them in 1907. The family moved back to Ross Carberry. They opened a business, but it wasn't successful, so they went to live in Convent Hill in Bandon. He worked, his father worked at various jobs. However, to, um, because of financial hardships, like many others, the whole family was forced to, to emigrate to Liverpool. Tom remained in Ireland to save his work. Bandon was a loyalist town. In the 16th century, hundreds of English families were planted there. The Irish were driven from their fertile lands and from their homes, and the stolen lands were seized by planters. A notice erected on Bandon said, a Turk? A Jew or an atheist may reside in this town, but not a papist. A wit wrote no, close to that notice. He who wrote this did write it well, for the same is written on the gates of hell. By the 20th century, families had moved back, Irish families had moved back in Bandon, but it still had a very strong pro British element. Tom was 17 when he joined the British Army in 1915. He was stationed in a number of locations during World War I, and he was gassed and wounded. Quite a Mesopotamia, he noticed a posted communique. He noticed a posted communique, which reported on a rebellion in Dublin. The clarity and beauty of the text of the proclamation enthralled Tom. The notice was a turning point in his life. He returned to Cork in February 1919 and read Irish history voraciously. He learned quickly of the successes of the Gale of the Sassnock, and he also learned of the many failed efforts of freedom, the genocidal assaults, and the seventh century of barbarous oppression. And now, in his own lifetime, he, he knew of the Easter Rising, the execution of our leaders, and the imprisonment of our freedom fighters. With his newfound knowledge of his country's history and the events of the 1916 Rising, all that awakened the consciousness of young Tom Barry. His life would take a very different course. He would become a most committed, fearless combatant and leader in the battle for Irish freedom. The 1916 Rising and the organization of the volunteers had awakened a strong national spirit throughout the country. With the exception of the heroic fight mounted by the, the Kent family in Cork, Cork did not participate in the Easter Rising due to a failure of communications. So the organization of the volunteers and its leadership was left intact. Along with the volunteers, there were other nationalist organizations like Common Amal Nathana, Common Lu Class Bale, the Gay League, and others. But all these groups had strong presence in Cork and with the leadership of men of the like from Moss the First and Terence McQueen and others of extremely high caliber, all these organizations were gaining more confidence and determination day by day. The ultimate aim was to secure Irish freedom and the establishment of the Sovereign Republic. The Irish did succeed in establishing a 32 county doll area which assembled in January 1919 in the Mansion House. The IRA was the unpaid Irish force defending both the legitimate government and the Irish people. Ireland's indefeasible sovereignty was established, but England decided to go to war with the express will of the people and to crush it with military terrorism, every aspect of our independence. The national and alien government could not function side by side. One had to be destroyed, wrote Tom Barry. As 1919 moved into 1920, England violence continued. The third West Cork Brigade was formed in January 1919. Cork became the most militant active county in the country. 
and have won international reputation for stunning victories and contests with the British Army. Tom enlisted as an intelligence officer in um, the 2nd of July in 1919 with the 3rd Corps Corp Brigade, and by the following year, in July 1920, he was an active volunteer. Tom Kelleher said, Barry was bursting with constructive ideas. He was mature beyond his years, a genius. On joining the IRA, Tom immersed himself in the struggle and immediately set to work organizing training for volunteers so they could successfully confront the enemy. He learned to act with lightning speed and decisively. Security, mobility, moving silently with speed was dinned into them and they could have not, not have been more willing to carry out orders. He quickly became a commander and was always very conscious of protecting the lives of the volunteers who campaigned with him. He earned the complete confidence of his men, who placed complete trust in any decisions he made. They even trusted him with their very lives. He knew the savagery of the enemy, and he also said the IRA was forced to trust to attempt to break by armed action the British domination of seven centuries duration. By July 1920, Tom's comrades, Tom Hales and Tom Hart, were arrested by the RIC and handed over to Percival and the Essex Torture Squad, from whom they received some of the worst tortures in the Anglo-Irish War. The men were stripped naked, dragged for miles behind the lorries, their hair was torn out, their nails were pulled off with tweezers, and much, much more. The torture broke heart and heart to the same. He was transferred to a mental hospital, and he died just a few years later in his home. Tom Hales was sent to Pensacola Prison. That barbarism had a profound effect on Tom Barry. Enemy pressure increased by 1920 to 21 to trigger a concentration on Cork. English troops poured into Cork. Tom was meticulous in planning every ambush operation, but he had to contend with the paucity of guns, ammunition, bombs, army, vehicles, and he had no fortified barracks to retire to. Also, the volunteers were unpaid. However, the army, which sprang from the people, had the backing of the deep underground people of West Cork. The Essex and Auxiliaries were notorious for engaging in orgies of destruction, burning, looting, brutalizing, and murdering civilians and volunteers, and generally terrorizing the countryside. The Turing ambush of the 22nd of October 1920 was organized to confront two to three lorry loads of Essex. Each element of the attack was well rehearsed and included the bomb which was to explode beneath the first the English lorry. However, the mine failed to detonate. Tom jumped into the centre of the road and hurled a bomb at the approaching lorry. It didn't explode either, but the lorry lurched and struck a dive. None of Tom's men were injured. Five English were killed and others were wounded for giving first aid. The column collected enemy weaponry. They released enemy prisoners with an instruction to Percival. If you continue to torture and murder, expect to be treated only as murderers. The endurance and steadfastness of Tom Collin was again tested at Kilmichael on the 28th of November, 1920. Such was Tom's ingenuity that he made immense use of the bends and the curves of the road and the Negro rock formations, which would afford some protection for his volunteers in the barren countryside. The column of 36 riflemen, armed with a rifle and 35 rounds each, assembled at 2 a.m. A few had revolvers, and Tom had two Mills bombs, which he had captured at Turingham. Father O'Connell heard of confessions before the, con the column moved off in against the lashing rain. Moving silently, they were soaked through when they arrived at the location of the ambush at 8.15 in the morning. Here, they were battered with the auxiliary. Merciless killers who were believed to be invincible. England had been forced. But Tom Barry had planned the encounter for success with the utmost precision. The men lay in soggy ground, their clothing wet from a night of sleet and rain, and the cold was intense. They began to freeze and their bones grew stiff from their bodies. Just after four, the scouts signaled the approach of the enemy. Tom dressed in uniform, was in the centre of the road in open view. As the lorries drew near him, he hurled the bomb, a Mills bomb at it, killing the driver. He blew his whistle and fired his automatic in the back of his arm. The fight was intense at close quarters and even hand to hand. The auxiliaries were cursing and yelling, but the IRA, the Irish forces, were tight lipped. The auxiliaries were destructive on that day. They were defeated. 
Three Irish volunteers were pinned due to an auxiliary forward surrender, and the deaths of the volunteers greatly pained Tom. This resulting Irish victory boosted the morale of the volunteers, it further invigorated the support base, and it sent shockwaves through the English military and police circles right up to its highest echelons. The Tom was hospitalised with a heart problem after Kilmichael. He was continuously engaged in organising and planning military operations. Sometimes the enemy did not appear because informers had forewarned them. The band in Essex under Percival continued to torture and kill defenceless IRA prisoners, so Tom decided to bring a column of 44 strong into the town during curfew to confront the enemy. Unexpectedly, he came face to face with five enemy military. Facing them, he opened fire with a revolver in one hand and an automatic in the other. Volunteer Mick Bowley joined him. The gunfire brought down three enemy, the fourth boarded, and the fifth made Ferrier of the dreaded Essex ran with Tom Barry in pursuit. Ferrier was now panic stricken. He had previously tried to infiltrate the IRA. He ran into a shop, cleared the counter, Barry vaulted over him after them and sent Ferrier to come to the because Barry Battle of the 18th of March 1921 was another astounding success. The column was being encircled by British forces who were converging on them from all sides. Tom assembled his men. He told them they'd smash their way out of the encirclement. It would be a fight to the last man and the last round. That day, 104 volunteers routed a British force of 1,250 plus. The road and fields round Cross Barry were strewn with the dead bodies of the British corpses, who were trained, instructed, organised and paid to bring terror and death into the lives and homes of the Irish. Tom mounted an audacious attack on Roscarbury Barracks. With the removal of that barracks, the IRA would have had an area, free area, roughly of about 270 square miles. The enemy would be outside it. The volunteers carried coffin-like on their shoulders an extremely sensitive bomb right to the barrack door. Tom and Mick Crowley pushed a flat stone under it and tilted it forward. They withdrew silently and booked his feet. The bomb exploded, followed by gunfire and bombing. Tim O'Donoghue feared for Tom's life. He said he was for hours dodging bombs and throwing bombs, paraffin shooting without a break, and after an explosion he opened from the flare of the flame. The action lasted five hours and the garrison surrendered. Unsurprisingly, Tom took the public inside during the Civil War. At the end of June 1922, he was arrested by anti proclamation Act and jailed in Mount Joy. He records that the Republic in prison was treated abominably. Tom was put in solitary confinement in his basement cell in the basement, in the most inhumane conditions. He was suffocating for lack of air. After three weeks in that hellhole, BTIs came to his cell, they caught him by the legs, and they dragged him up the iron steps, banging and smashing his head on each step, rendering him almost unconscious. In September, Tom, by September, he had escaped, moving secretly and slept, he slept in trees, and he eventually arrived in Cork. Back in operation and working with Republican forces, he had organised a massive 580 riflemen. He had run in Cork City, held all the roads to McCroom, Bandon, Kinsale and Cole. He sprang on Bandon and took it. He drove treaty ice from Ballinin and Enniskeen. The Republicans had no jail, so they released their, their prisoners. He swiftly took Glengarrow, marched on into Gila and captured it, and also captured Ballyfikira and Balaborna. A hand-to-hand -hand fight in Cakel resulted in the Republicans securing that town. He was fighting fit and slept little. Tom, the brilliant organiser, the indefatigable, irrepressible soldier. In Tipperary, he launched a spectacular attack on Carrigan Shore, captured the town, defeated the treaty troops, and captured 115 rifles, two machine guns, and stores of food and clothing. He continued with these men and forced the surrender of Thomastown, Callan, and Mullinava. He marched through villages and towns, anti proclamation troops paralysed by the military mastery of the elusive, brilliant, daring commander, didn't whimper. With the volunteers, he marched into Limerick, and he told the police base to help Tom Barry drop their guns and give you the peace. Three tanks used English emergency powers and engaged in atrocities worse than the Pan War. On the 
on the 8th of November in Dublin, trained the Republicans were just parading with a machine gun to death. Republican prisoners were tortured and murdered in execution. I do proclamation I proclaim this war that the Muslims burned it on Republicans. 20,000 Republicans a day on road that rotten and moral government killed, tortured, and destroyed our people to get hold our information. Trump continued his involvement in Republicanism, and Republicanism when the Civil War was over. He was treated reprehensibly by the pension board, as was his courageous comrade in arms, Tom Kelleher, as in the Leviathan. Tom Kelleher was asked to write a pardon to that obnoxious man, Van Cooper. In 1937, Tom Barry was part of a protest in Dublin against the Leinster House regime welcoming the English monarch, monarch to Ireland. The police back in charge of the demonstration. Sheila Humphrey is recalled the savage way the police deliberately battened Tom Barry. She said he displayed the most extraordinary courage. He just walked through them. His skull was smashed with a rifle butt and he was rendered unconscious. His friends thought him dead. He was hospitalised. When he recovered consciousness, he left the hospital with his head swathed in bandages. He addressed a huge crowd assembled for the second arrangement of the same meeting. Tom undertook a grueling tour of America in 1949, addressing thousands of people at several meetings, various meetings. He was greeted with rapturous and prolonged applause. He was seeking support for a concerted effort to end the English position in Ireland. Along with his military activities, Tom was a true humanitarian. He helped countless people who were suffering difficulties throughout his life, and his generosity continued right up to his latter days. He negotiated a reduction in a bank, which was putting great pressure on a small family farm, and he succeeded. He was constantly giving money and help to the vulnerable. On learning of old comrades who were hospitalized, ill, or in need, he visited them and he'd always leave an envelope, a sealed envelope, with either 10 or 20 pounds in it, which was a lot of money then. He bought a new suit for a man who was out of work and he'd done any job. On building a school for special children, on his departure, Tom would leave an envelope with a generous donation to buy something for the children. He was a man of enormous compassion. He believed it was his duty to help others in need. Many people sought his assistance and he generously gave help. When we go hurling, it brought him playing to Michael, who burned to death in an accidental fire in Dublin in 1949. Tom and Liam Deasy brought his back, body back to Skibbereen for burial. He also attended to the costs. When the war erupted in the north in 1969, he attended pack meetings in Cork and spoke in defence of the nationalist community and against partition. In 1980, at Cross he said, and I quote, in addition today, I don't want this to fall out until the same prayers are said for the men who have been crucified in the hate blocks. I want you to say the prayers for them too, to show our unity with these men. Tom is buried here in a modest cross with his beloved wife, Leslie, who he married in 1921. She was in Common She was in, G in the GPO in 1916. She became chairman of the Red Cross and was decorated by the German, Italian and Netherlands governments for her outstanding service to the Red Cross Society. And in 1978, she received the International Committee for Risk of War. She suffered a stroke in August 1975 that caused paralysis. She was hospitalised in Serkin while he visited her every day. Tom died on the 2nd of July 1980. His coffin draped in the tricolour way before the altar in St. Peter and Paul's Church. Father Cotter Price, the nephew of his wife, celebrated the Mass. He was buried without pomp or ceremony on the 4th of July 1980. Leslie died in April 84. Tom, a heroic warrior, will forever live in the heart and in the memory of Ireland. The great God will surely have welcomed Tom and Leslie into heaven, for all is well with the souls of the just, said the Lord. I wish they could ever have